Hello, YouTube. I would like to talk about the original MakerBot replicator printer. Now, this wasn't the first MakerBot printer. However, it was the first like really successful one that also worked pretty well. In this video, I want to talk about my history in 3D printing, then where this printer fits in. Let's see. <gasps> it still works. <laughs> well, still works with a few asterisks. So let's go down here to utilities. I've replaced a lot of things on this, including this. I rebuilt this with tack switches before it was just carbon switches and it kind of sucked. Uh, statistics. All right, so just under 2000 hours. I don't use this thing nearly as much as I used to. This was my primary 3D printer from 2012 to 2015. So I guarantee you like 80% of those hours was in that uh, period of time. But I still do use it. Um, I actually use it for a uh, TPU, like the rubberized plastic. The reason for that is twofold. The printer is kind of slow, but you have to print TPU slow anyway, so it doesn't matter. And it still has one of the most close relations between the drive gear and the extruder, which is good for the flexible filament. Conversely, a separate Bowden tube style printer such as this doesn't work as well with flexible filament. So that's what I use the MakerBot for still. Well, I want to load up. How do I get out of here? Shouldn't I know that? Shouldn't you know? Aren't you God? Change filament. Unload left. So yes, there's been many, many things I've updated on this printer. One of the first was these new uh, extruder levers. This was actually something that uh, I think it was on Thingiverse. Not that long after this printer was released. Now I'm going to load left. The original version of the extruder was, I don't know, had this really weird like plunger thing. It wasn't even spring loaded. So then someone designed these levers, which work a lot better than MakerBot use the design on the Replicator 2. So yeah, the extruder grip I changed. I think I also changed the grip wheels on the motors, but believe it or not, these are still the original two nozzles from 2012. Yeah, they still work. Something else I upgraded. Uh, there's a place that sells these uh, CNC machined arms for the main bed. Originally these were uh, formed plastic. I think they were, I think they were injection molded, but they warp over time. So I don't know what I spent on these, probably $80. So this makes the build platform nice and rigid and flat. Also, let's see, the power supply failed. The power supply, I changed it. It used to have like a big old brick, like the Xbox uh, 360. So when I got the new power supply, I actually made a custom enclosure for it. And then I also put a fan at the bottom, so it's not an enclosed brick. It actually has airflow over it, so I actually removed the outer shell and made a airflow shell for the new power supply, and it's been fine ever since. Oh, I also changed the, uh, the Z-switch. See how it's got a little slide on it? So you can actually adjust the Z by turning that screw. Mega Freeze Hairspray. This is my go-to for Captain Tape. The captain of her heart. Yes! There it goes! <laughs> Alright, it's gonna heat up. I like this uh, bar graph here. This is nice. Of course, now they all have fancy LCDs. So this actually wasn't my first 3D printer. The first 3D printer that I ever had and used was the briefcase printer that we built on an episode of the Ben Heck Show. I wanna say that was 2011. That one worked out pretty well, and I actually used that printer for a couple months. Eventually we gave it away because that was always a thing back then, like, oh, everything we build, we wanna do as a giveaway. But no, for a couple months, I actually just used that 3D printer. Again, that would've been like 2011, early 2012. The America's Most Haunted, which used to be called Ghost Squad, the pinball machine. A lot of the early prototype parts on that were actually made on that printer. And I'll try to include some photos of them here because I probably still have them in a folder someplace. So yeah, uh, and then even before that, uh, a friend of mine, Chris, he had this McWire 3D printer in like 2009. And I know we were trying to use 3D printing for the Bill Paxton pinball machine, so it goes way back. Yeah, and then, you know, that's when RepRap started to be a big thing. And 
back then when you'd buy a 3D printer, you would, uh, like Maker Gear had the best, best extruder. You'd buy one of those, but you'd still have to be like wrapping Nichrome wire, which is like what's in your toaster, around brass bolts. And that's how you made an extruder. That was like 2010. It's crazy how much how much it's changed. I was at a show talking to Rick uh, from Maker Gear about that, and uh, that was in 2018. And even then, it felt like a huge expanse of time. It was just, but it was only like eight years. So the Megabot Replicator One. So before this, they had like the cupcake. They had the uh, Thingamatic, I think, that had a conveyor belt or something. So I'm at CES 2012, and that would have been in January of that year, and I'm going to the roof of this hotel and I, I, I think I was like on a show I think it was either like was G4 still a thing then it was, it was either G4 or MTV I don't know I think Jeff Keeley was there so I get to the roof and the only person I know is Jeff so I felt kind of you know kind of weird being on TV and stuff but anyway as I'm going up there I run into well okay I know a lot of people kind of you know take umbrage with him but I run into Bree from MakerBot and uh, we knew each other and he's holding this thing under his arm, <laughs> like, like, like a, like a case of beer. And I'm like, oh, cool! You've got the, you've got the new replicator there. He's like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. And I was like, yeah, I stopped by your booth at uh, CES, and y you guys were the only ones that were making something besides like 3D televisions and Android knockoff tablets. Again, remember this was 2012. Everything was like 3D. And he's like, yeah, you should check it out. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. So I hit up the booth a couple times. Then many months later, I want to say it was September, it was either August or September 2012, I go to the local hacker space, uh, Sector 67 here in Madison, and they have a MakerBot representative who's there for like, I don't know, sales day or something, and he's like, hey, it's the MakerBot replicator. Of course, he's trying to get the hacker space to buy some, I think they did, and he's like, this thing can print something the size of a loaf of bread. It's like, what kind of loaf of bread is this small? Come on, is this some like New York crap? But, uh, but no, anyway, I, I got a lot more detail about the printer then, and I'm like, I think I'm gonna buy one. And it's crazy, so these printers, oh, I wanna say, what did I get it for? I think they might have given me a slight discount because I had a YouTube channel, but I wanna say it was like just under $2,000, and that was with two spools of filament, so $2,000 for a wooden printer. It seems like a lot, and I guess it was, but again, this is before China entered the market, and this thing was actually made in Brooklyn. Yeah. So it, uh, this, again, I've never, well, I've, I've updated the firmware, but I've never changed it. So this is still running the original MakerBot uh, Sailfish variant. I mean, I guess I could update the firmware, but why? I mean, it's still an 8-bit machine. It's not going to get that much faster. So yeah, I uh, called up, I actually ordered it directly from MakerBot. This would have been like, well, 10 years ago. That's why I'm making this video, because it's been 10 years that I've had this printer. And, uh, yeah, I took a couple weeks. I remember they uh, they sent it to the wrong address. They sent it to a warehouse across the road from where our shop was. I'll put up a Google map right now. There, you can you can, you can can go back in time and dox me from where I used to, used to be at. Actually, I actually walked past the old, old shop last spring. It's now a uh, cold storage for a food bank, I want to say. And I believe someone must have bought the property because everything was, they completely redone it. They, they, tore, they tore out all the walls except for the bathroom and they redid all the drywall. So it basically just turned into a big giant room. I think they, they probably kicked out, well, yeah, they did kick out the junky tenants. They had these really junky tenants that were there near the end. It's one, one of the reasons we moved to the bigger shop in 2014. Like, it was like a Wisconsin farmer kind of thing. Sorry, Wisconsin farmers. It was, it was like, these guys had like 10 cars they were working on any time. They're just sitting sitting there using up space. And I think the thing that really bugged me is their units on the end were just filled with junk. So I think they were like, they started out as like, oh, like storage unit auctions. Yeah, because sometimes I would go to dump out the garbage or Felix would go to dump out the garbage and there would be like family photos in the garbage bin, like in frames and everything. So like these people would like, yeah, buy storage units, which of course are 99% garbage in the real world, not TV. And then they'd fill up the dumpsters with all the useless stuff. It was so macabre, like just seen like family photos in frames, like like had come off of like, you know, like a bookshelf or something in, in the dumpster. But what really bugged me is 
the fire inspector got after us for having an extension cord on the floor. But then these people were smoking in their units and the units looked like something, it looked like that, like that scene in Labyrinth where there's a junk lady and she's like, you don't need all this stuff. It looked, it looked like that. And it's like, oh, so the fire inspector gives us crap for an extension cord on the floor, but apparently they're just fine. Where was I? Oh yeah, so anyway, they delivered this printer to the place across the street. So I had to call him, I had to walk over there and pick it up. And then I came back, I still remember that. And then, uh, then I had this printer, which you've no doubt seen on the Ben Heck Show many, many times. But yeah, I, I still use it. So I've got it set to uh, 80 millimeters a second. That's not that slow. It, it actually still does a pretty good job. We'll take a, a look at it when it comes out here. Yeah, so that was that was 10 years ago as of me making this video. Uh, so I've actually been using 3D printers for longer than that, but I've 10 years I've used my first commercially purchased 3D printer. So one of the problems MakerBot had, uh, this thing was open source, so Chinese companies cloned it like mad. A lot of my friends bought, like, I think the brand was CTC, basically a, a clone of this wood and everything for like 500 bucks. So I, I got one of the better clones of the Flash Forge. I think this was like $1,000. I think this was the second one that I bought myself, uh, 2015. This one I always had trouble with. It never really had very consistent prints. And so uh, I gave it to my brother-in-law. Well, they're separated now, but actually he just visited today. And I was like, look what I did to your printer. So then when everything was shut down, I got the printer back from him and I replaced all the electronics with Big Tree Tech SKR 1.3. So it's now 32-bit with Trinamic drivers for the steppers. And now this printer is super reliable and super fast. So that was my second one. Then in 2016, I got the Maker Gear M2, which is this guy here. This was also made in America. I believe it's Ohio. But uh, this one was also fairly expensive. I want to say it was like 1600 But look at this. It's got all like solid aluminum, steel, extrusions, chassis. This one is like super solid. I did, however, rebuild the entire extruder because I didn't like... They had like a, they had a pinch, they did have a pinch wheel on the filament, but it was just the plastic bending that wasn't a proper hinge. So I actually redesigned everything. Uh, so I gave it the same kind of uh, lever as you saw in the maker about there. So see how there's a lot of pressure that's pressed onto the plastic to the grip wheel. And this one's all magnetic. So like if you need to clear a jam, you have, you have to cut the filament, but you can actually pull this out as well. There's all these double-sided neodymium magnets. It's, it's, that's the final hole that lines up into the hot end. I think I also had to replace the hot end on this one. But then, but then yeah, if you have to clear a jam, this is all magnetic. And of course, now that I rebuilt it and it has an easy to clear jam, now it never jams. I think I might have had to do it once. It's not as fast as the custom flash forge, but this one has the best print quality. So when I want to print something that is really good, like this uh, rack for the new pinball machine I'm working on. Oh no, exposed! There's some sort of linear motion in the pinball machine. So like if I want to print something like this, this is the printer I use. And I still use Simplify 3D, although they haven't made a new version of this in years. Apparently there's a 5.0 coming. I, I really hope they release it because this is my favorite to use. I mean, I also use Kira for some other stuff, but I just like this program the best because I know it and also I think it works better than Kira. Although quite often Simplify 3D will get the time estimates wrong. It's bang on for this machine. This machine, the estimates are perfect, but like the Maker Gear, it's about 50% off. This one, it says 34 minutes. Actually, that seems about right. Uh, yeah, so far, I mean, I, well, I can't really see it very well here. It doesn't look too bad. We'll take a closer look once it's done, like we have with the printer. The MakerBot is completely covered with stickers. I really wish the kids could have seen it, but the side of the windows are covered with stickers from all the places where we've already been. Like Elvis Aram on the Tupperware Museum, the Bull Weevil Monument in Cranberry World, Pool Dog Hall of Fame. Oh, I can remember about 80% of it. So you may have seen some of my uh, Anycubic uh, reviews. Actually, they have another one they're sending to me and I actually might uh, have my niece be in it, even though I tell her, do not be a YouTuber. So it's like, oh, Uncle Ben used to be a YouTuber. It's like, don't do it. Being a YouTuber is like, oh, I want to be a movie star or I want to be in the NFL. It's like, you know what? It's like 99% luck. I did a review on this one. I think it was about a year ago. So this one here, I actually have a Octopi. So yeah, it's in there in that little box. And I think I did a video about this one, but this one is the one where there is an arm. So there's actually an Octopi script where if the bed completely cools, the arm will knock the part off. And then you can like have a box that it goes into. 
This is an older Anycubic they sent me to review. I'm probably going to give this to my uncle, my engineer uncle. Wait, how many uncles do I have who are engineers? I've got this uh, Cobra Plus sitting here in the middle of the room. I need to clean off these tables. Th these tables are so messy. Like, so now I found this in my mom's garage. This is my stepdad's old TV. I'm sure some of you are going to freak out when you see this. It's 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 the TV from Deckard's bathroom in uh, Blade Runner. It's like this Panasonic portable TV that like pops up. I think it's like upside down at the moment. Yeah, so like the TV actually pops out of the unit. I was trying to get it working, but I couldn't. So yeah, this, most of the stuff on this table has been sitting here since last Christmas. Last Christmas, you gave me your table and the very next day I filled it with crap. I still have this big one, the Anycubic Max. This actually came in pretty handy right around the time of the review because there was a project I helped a local production company with, made this some um, huge uh, pot, well, I don't know what else to call it, a pot head appliance, like a, a person whose head is a flower pot. And without this printer, I couldn't have printed it. Isn't that right, bud? Bud, do I need to replace the carpet down here? Yeah, I know, I, I tested the new shower drain without hooking up the pipe. It was pretty bad. We'll get like some floating floor down here. That'll be better than this stupid carpet. Carpets are stupid. They want you to draw me like one of your French cats. But Ben, surely you can't keep that printer running for another 10 years. I don't know. I've got a new old stock replacement for the motherboard. I, someone on the East Coast sent that to me. Oh, I've got another spare motherboard with the five volt mod done. I've got a spare build plate. This is from somebody else's replicator they took apart. And I've even got a spare power supply <laughs> new in box. So I think we're good. Bud, why did you have to get so big? I remember when you were small, I could easily put you on my desk or behind a keyboard, but now you're a mega cat and you've got a primordial pouch, which is where all your goo is stored. Don't even think about that. Don't even think about doing that. Don't do it. Smee tried to stop me. Look at this thing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like Star Trek, the motion picture. We have come across V'ger. The orifice is opening. V'ger is trying to join with its creator. It's like the opening of Spaceballs too. Last year at the vet, he weighed 13 pounds and they were like, he needs to lose two pounds. So I got him an automatic feeder. So I kind of doubt he only weighs 11 pounds. I, he doesn't, you know, when you look at him, when he's like walking around, like looking at him straight down, his belly doesn't protrude sideways. He's he's just a big cat. I don't know what to say, right, bud? When I was looking at houses, this is like a single story ranch house. It's not that big. It's like 1,100 square feet. So it's got like, I can't show that pinball machine. It's got uh, the prototype one right below us. It's got this like semi-finished basement and it's got the uh, 0.5 bath. I made sure that the, ins uh, not the insurance, what was that guy's name? Tax guy, I'm like, Please note what my 0.5 bathroom looks like. It's a toilet. But down here, see all this cedar? The person who built this house, his job was he was a knife sharpener. So he actually built his house with a workshop in the basement. Like see how he's got this doorbell? So people that needed their knives sharpened would come in the back door. And there's actually still a sticker on the back door that says ring doorbell or whatever. And then there was another door there. I think that was to like, keep the customers from like messing with his family or something. But yeah, so people would come down the steps and then they, that's why I had these two doorbells here. And uh, then they had this transaction window, which is a square. And uh, yeah, but then, so like one third of the basement was set up as a shop. And so when I saw that, I'm like, oh, this is perfect, right? There was a cedar wall right here going up to that beam. I tore that out. I did that before I moved in. But the thing that makes it good is because there's, that's why there's all these outlets everywhere. There's outlets everywhere. Uh, yeah, and then there's this like this wall. I use it for like papers and stuff, but I covered a good chunk of it with a dry erase board. But anyway, the reason I bring it up is because over here, so I guess this was his transaction window, but there's an extra power outlet here because there's power outlets everywhere. Oh yeah, here's this crazy doorbell system. Look at all this stuff. I need to rip this out sometime. Anyway, I wonder if I could make like, build like another little table and move that printer over here. See, I still have lots of stuff I can give away 
next time I have a show. Like, well, I'm, I've been trying. I, well, I want to build like my own like 1980s portable computer, like one of these screens. I got this one. And I got this one, which is a full graphics display. It has an inverter circuit on it. It needs negative nine volts. Oh, I did buy this. I don't know if I talked about this in the video, but someone had the Harlequin, Harlequin clone of the ZX Spectrum. So I bought the parts to start put that, putting that together. I don't know why. It's not like I need any more projects. Like this Raspberry Pi 400. Why did I buy it? Oh, there's another one over there. Nice. I wonder if the old guy whose name was Al... Wait, I shouldn't dox him. I wonder if the old guy whose name was Al... I wonder if, I wonder if he kept a gun under here. Are there like any places? No, I mean, I probably would have if I was him. Just in case, you know. Oh, wait, he's got a knife shop. He could just like throw knives through the window. Something I need to do this fall, the flower bed outside of this, outside of this wall. I put in a French drain this summer. The flower bed was kind of destroyed in the process, so I should probably just chemically nuke it and start over. Now it's turned into like a gross jungle. Anyway, now that I improved the drainage there, I need to pull everything away from the wall and re-acid and reseal the wall since I've improved the drainage. I did that over here, like you can see you can see where it flaked up the first winter and then the first, a year after the first winter, I redid that drainage and I need to re-acid that wall too. So just something I've been doing one wall at a time. Actually, I actually think I'm pretty much done. I mean, I can't do anything with the front of the house because there's bushes and stuff, but I'm also gonna do driveway, which should fix the drainage on the north side of the house. I put this TV here, I think it's like 55 inches. This used to be in the break room of the shop and I think I just bought it to use up taxable income. I mean, we did use it, but I never use it. It's like, oh, it's like, oh, I could watch like movies or something while I work, but I never use it. I should like put it upstairs in my bedroom or something. Yeah, and the thing that sucks is like this, this TV has uh, HDR and the TV in my living room doesn't. So this TV is actually better for color and stuff, even though it's, I don't think it's big enough for a living room TV, but yeah, I put all the work and say this, th he had all these like uh, wall anchors with threads. So I had to do that, I had to put in my new, my own wall anchors, and I actually bought a uh, hammer drill just to do it, just to install this TV, and I never use it. Like, if this TV has run 10 hours the entire time I've lived here, I'd be surprised. Yeah, there is a little bit of ring, and it's not perfect, but yeah, it's not too bad for such an old machine made out of wood. Something I probably should do, because I haven't, I don't think I've done it since I moved out of the shop, is every so often, you want to tighten these pulleys. See how they have set screws? Um, if one of them gets a little loose, you'll start getting, uh, you know, well, you'll have like ovals and some circles. So I should probably do that one of these days. That's probably something I could do when I move all this tabling, all the tabling? That's something I could do when I move this table out and, and paint the walls. So I could also use that time to you know, do some maintenance on the printer. Couldn't you do that right now, Ben? Shut up. I do wish there were windows down here. There is actually a window right there. And then there's another one over there as well. But obviously they're covered up with whatever this board is. That part kind of sucks. Cause actually there would be a good amount of sunlight that would come through that window since that is south. <laughs> Holding it in place pretty well. <clears throat> this chunk of metal here. There we go. It's always good to have a chunk of metal around. So it held pretty well, but you can see there's like, well, you can see the, the individual paths of the first layer. So I think the Z could be a little tighter. As I mentioned, there's that adjustable thing in the back. Although it's kind of sloppy. I have to admit, I could have done a better job with it. I have to admit. I mean, but it did, it did, it did work. And the thing that, so this is, um, this, the Z is probably a little bit more open than it should be. But then a positive of that is you're not going to have really any elephant's foot in it at all. This is going to be quite flat with no compression on the end of it. As far as the layers go, I mean, you can see some, is that what, that, is that what they call ringing? Well, it doesn't look good. Like, actually, you can see it in the same place each time. Yeah, it's less pronounced there. So it's probably 
probably a loose pulley that I need to tighten as I mentioned I will I will do that as far as the layers themselves I think here it might have under extruded very slightly the actual layers themselves are still pretty good I would say I mean it's not an amazing print but for what it is after all these years I think it's definitely serviceable well this is a coarse print this is printed at point three layer height let's make sure that it should interface so this is with two different machines yeah it interfaces just fine that's cool yeah I can actually use this I should maybe try adjusting the Z a little bit although well yeah because you wouldn't want this to be a visible surface because well what was this okay this one's got like a glassy I mean it should look more like this see how it's basically like glass because well it was on glass and you can usually see the glue stick, you know, the glue stick lines in it. But it, sh it should look like a compressed, you know, like a compressed piece of plastic. There shouldn't be gaps. So that was probably the only thing I would say is a negative, despite the ringing. But yeah, as I mentioned, I'll probably tune up the machine when I'm taking my desk and moving it and everything. So I'll probably do that in, probably in the, somewhere in the next month or so. But yeah, so yeah, that's the story of the... MakerBot Replicator 1, their first really successful printer. And I've been using it for 10 years, and not like I use it all the time, but it still works when I need it. And I don't, well actually, let me show you one of the, well this, these are for the single-handed controllers that I make, so. Uh, yeah, here's an example. Like, this is for when I move the four face buttons, like A, B, X, Y. I move it from the right and move it over to the left. And so yeah, this, yeah, that's what it should look like. It should basically... I mean, you can still see the lines, but there's no separation. So yeah, I'll actually print these uh, on the MakerBot. And, you know, again, the quality's not incredibly high. These... So this I printed at 80 millimeters a second. This you have to print at 15 because it's a different type of plastic. It's kind of like nylon. You have to print it a lot slower. But again, since MakerBot is old and slow, it's a perfect thing for it to do. So I usually just use, I usually just leave the TPU installed in it all the time. And that's, every time someone buys a left-handed controller from me, it has something printed on the old replicator. Well, there you have it. The story and the history of the first commercial 3D printer I ever bought 10 years ago. And 10 years later, it's still going strong. I mean, it still works. I think it's cool seeing how long you can get things to last. So who knows, maybe this printer will still work in another 10 years. And maybe in another 10 years, Simplify will finally release version 5. Alright, well I just wanted to make that quick video because it's the printer's 10 year birthday. We'll see you in the next video.